الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنام سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه الكرام رب الشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, my brothers and sisters, those of you who are planning to go to Hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and keep you in good health and fulfill your desire and your aspiration and your intention, inshallah, to perform the Hajj and make this Hajj uh, Hajjan maqbulan, uh, mabruran, inshallah, wa sayyan mashkuran. Hajj that is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a blessed Hajj to remove the sins and make you bring you back to your home, to your families, uh, clean and pure like the day you were born. Uh, hajj, uh, we are talking about not about the fiqh of Hajj, the rules of Hajj, uh, but we are talking about uh, the, the purpose of Hajj, the spirituality of Hajj. Hajj, as you know, is uh, one of the pillars of Islam. It is the fifth rukun in Arkan al-Islam. And it is very much emphasized, the Prophet ﷺ said, though any person who makes Hajj without committing any sin, speaking bad words or doing bad deeds, will return the day his mother gave him the birth as pure and as clean. Al-Hajj al-Mabru lays lahu jazaun illa al-Jannah. The Hajj that is done in the right way, acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no other reward for it except Jannah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give Jannah to those who perform the Hajj and inshallah keep them in good health. Hajj is unique among all the ibadat of Islam. Islam, as you know, is a complete way of life. It has uh, aqidah, belief, it has ibadah, it has akhlaq, the models and the manners, and also it has rules and regulations. Things that are halal and things that are considered as haram. So it's a complete way of life. It covers every aspect of life, our personal life, our social life, our family life, our economic life, our political life, any aspect of human life that you can think of, you will find certain uh, guidance, certain uh, ethics and morals are given to us about that. So Hajj is among the ibadat, is very unique ibadah. Uh, ibadah requires, of course, your heart, your intention, but also your physical action and also certain financial obligations that come with it. Some ibadat, they have no financial obligations. You don't have to pay anything and perform the ibadah, such as your salat. Salat, when the time of salat comes, wherever you are, you perform the salat. So here is your intention, your heart, your mind, and your physical aspects. And uh, you have qiyam, ruku' and sujood. And if you cannot do it, you do it in the sitting position, lying in your bed, you can do that. So all of these things are because it is done five times a day. In a similar way, siyam, fasting, uh, does not cost any money. Uh, you have to stop eating early morning and continue until the evening time and that is done uh, during the month of Ramadan for the whole month as well as some other days if you want to do even Nawafil fasting you can do that. So fasting has a physical action as well as of course a spiritual action but there are no financial obligations. As far as zakat is concerned, zakat is all financial. If you have money and that money has reached the nisab, then you pay every year a certain amount for that. So, and there are a lot of details for that. So this is a financial ibadah. Ibadah in your money, ibadah in your wealth. 
But then Hajj, Hajj is both, actually it's all of that. It's uh, your heart, your mind, your soul, your body, as well as you spend some money. That's why Hajj is obligatory upon those who can afford it. If somebody has financial means enough to pay for his way, for her way, and uh, all the expenses, then Hajj becomes obligatory upon that person. But also it has physical capability, that is you are uh, capable to perform this journey and go through all that uh, rituals there, Tawaf and Sa'i and go to Arafat and Muzdalifah and all of this. So it is the physical activities that are there. So physical, financial, spiritual, all of them are combined in Hajj. And some people say that uh, it is a culmination of all the ibadat because you have Salat, you have Siyam, and you have Zakat, and then you have Hajj. So in Salat, you turn to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and pray to Allah. In Hajj, you do that. Uh, in Siyam, you abstain from certain things. In Hajj also, you abstain from certain things. When you put on Ihram, you abstain. So there's some kind of abstention also in Hajj. And then, of course, uh, in Zakat, you spend money. In Hajj, you spend money. So Hajj is a culmination. Hajj is, includes everything. And that is the beauty of Hajj, and that is the importance of Hajj. Another aspect that you can think of our ibadat are sacred acts done at sacred time and sacred places. Um, every, every ibadah has certain sacred act, the acts that are given to us and we, we are told that we should perform those deeds. So you make wudu in your for your salat, you stand up, so you make uh, qiyam, ruku, and sujood. So these acts are, we are told that these are the blessed acts when you do that, stand up before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with full intention and uh, recite something from the Quran and you go into ruku and you say subhan rabbi al-azim and you go into sujood and you say subhan rabbi al-ala. All of these things you do that. So these are, uh, acts that are very very powerful very blessed acts the acts that involve our our heart and our mind and our soul and uh, for salat you can do it at any place of course for jama'ah you go to the masjid or you can do the jama'ah any place but masajid are there so these are sacred places and uh, there are certain times that are given to us for salat that you do it in the morning, in the afternoon, early afternoon, and then the evening and night. So all these your five prayer times that are given to us. So you have sacred acts, sacred times, and sacred places. But for Salat, you can perform it any place. The Prophet said, ardu masjida. The whole earth is a masjid for me. So wherever the time comes, you can perform the prayer. When it comes to fasting, fasting is a spiritual act and it is done at a special time. Month of Ramadan is a special time. It's a very blessed month. So that is the time. But again, there is no place required. Wherever you are, you fast. So fasting has, is a special time. A special act is at a special time. But it can be done any place. When Zakat, Zakat uh, has no place, no time. It is a financial obligation. You do it once a year. Some people do it in Ramadan. You people can do it at any other time. Your own financial year. And on the basis of that, you give your Zakat. When it comes to Hajj, you have all the three. A spiritual acts done in a, in a special time and also done in a special place. So Hajj cannot be done in any other place except some places that are given to us. And those are, you perform it in Mecca. You perform the, the Tawaf, you perform the Sa'i. And then also you go to Muzdalifah and Mina. 
and Arafat. All of these are the places that are connected with Hajj. So Hajj is a special place, performed at a special place. And then Umrah, you can do it any time, but Hajj requires a time, a specific time. If somebody is not there on the 9th of Zulhajjah, then there is no Hajj, al Hajj Arafah. So one has to be there at a particular time. And the days before and the days after, in different ways, the rules that are there. So you see the uniqueness of Hajj. Uniqueness of Hajj is it is a sacred act at sacred place at sacred time. And that is a speciality of Hajj. That is the uniqueness of Hajj. That is, uh, one should keep that in mind that I am here performing these acts, but I cannot perform those acts in any other place except there where Allah SWT sent me. And Allah made it possible for me to go there and visit his house. Uh, Allah SWT says in the Quran that is, in awwala baytin wuta'ala nasi la ladhi bibakka huda mubarakan lil alameen fi ayatun bayinat. And uh, Allah SWT says, this is the first house that was established for mankind. And it is important that people should visit that house. So, if you can afford it, if you are financially capable, physically capable, then you perform the Hajj. So, Hajj is uh, when a haji, a person who performed haji, uh, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gave me enough means and he made me, uh, gave me good health that I'm able to visit these places and you perform those acts with sincerity of your heart. Here we come to a point that ibadah, as we mentioned before, ibadah is an act and ibadah also have the intention. The acts alone will not have that meaning unless there is a proper intention. So we call it manasik and maqasid. Manasik are the rituals. It is the plural of mansak are the rituals, the rules that you should follow. And you will be hearing a lot about the fiqh of hajj. So these are the manasik al hajj. But also understand they are maqasid of hajj, objectives of hajj. And these objectives have to be kept in our mind. Why we are there? What is the purpose of my being and coming in that place? And my, what is my intention? Because the intention must be pure and clean and good. So sometimes people call it Sha'ir and Masha'ir. Sha'ir are those places you visit them. وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ شَعَيْرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ those who uh, honor the sacred places of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is because of the taqwa of their hearts. So sha'ir are there, but then also, will you go to the sha'ir with masha'ir, with your feelings, with your heart, with your, with your soul, with your mind, and go away with the sincerity of the heart. And once you perform the hajj in that way, it will have effect on you. It will cleanse you, it will, it will purify you, it will make you a better person. So Hajj is uh, and all the ibadat, but especially Hajj, one has to keep in mind what is the, my objective, what is the pur purpose that I have come for. Now, and comes when you come to the, the manasik, as uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Hudu anni manasikakum. Take from me your manasik. That means every detail of Hajj, you have tried to find out how the Prophet ﷺ performed the Hajj. And the Fuqaha have, have gone in, through that. And they explain that in great detail. In a similar way as Salat, the Prophet ﷺ, pray as you have seen me praying. So people observe the, the Salat of the, of the Prophet ﷺ, the Wudu of the Prophet ﷺ, and they have uh, given us the details. And our Fuqaha have elaborated that. So we try to make our Salat as much 
like the Salat of the Prophet as much as we can, as much as it is possible for us. And the best Salat was the Salat of Rasulullah So follow that way. In a similar way, he said when he performed the Hajj, he said, Khuzu anni manasikakum. Take from me the way you should perform your Hajj. So these are manasik. Observe the rules. Know what is fard, know what is sunnah, know what is nafl, know what is halal, what is haram, what will make it your hajj valid, what will make your hajj invalid, and where you have to make the kafara, and all those other details. It's important to know that. But all of these things should be done through understanding the maqsad of hajj. What is the maqsad? What is the objective? That involves niya. Innamal a'malu bin niyat. That involves niya. That means your intention. The intention must be for the sake of Allah. That is, uh, it is uh, with sincerity, with ikhlas, with total devotion, without being distracted by the mouth and the, and the shopping and this and that. Although those things are there, but at the same time, your intention is not that. You have not gone there to visit the, the, the malls and the, and the shopping centers. You are not there to spend your time just gossiping and talking to other people. You are there to do the ibadah. So devote yourself to ibadah. And only for the sake of Allah. Not for any other thing. Ikhlas, sincerity is very important. The other thing is continuously do the tawbah and istighfar. That is the best place to do that. Ask Allah SWT to forgive you. Forgive your sins of the sins of omission or commission. If you did things that you were not supposed to do, and if you did not do what you are supposed to do, all of these are sins. And one should be conscious of that. And ask Allah SWT to forgive. Allahumma qfilli ma qaddamtu ma akhart wa ma asrartu ma alant wa ma anta alamu bihi minni anta al muqaddim wa anta al muakhir Wallah forgive me whatever I omitted, whatever I committed, Whatever I know and whatever I did not know, whatever I did in open, openly and whatever I did as secretly, all my sins forgive. So this is tawbah, istighfar, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. And if we have done anything wrong to anybody else, to other human beings, then the, the way of Muslims is that, that before they go to hajj, they ask other people to forgive them. If they owe anything to somebody, they try to pay it off. And if, you have, if they have some amana that belongs to someone, they return the amana or they tell them that how it is going to be given back in case they got forbid that one, not, one is not back. So all of these things have to be kept, kept in mind to keep your hajj good, clean and pure and the intention is good. The other thing is uh, <clears throat> Uh, maqsad of, the ha of, 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 of any ibadah is to show our gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibadah is to become the servant of Allah. Allah akuna abdan shakura. Our Prophet used to pray a lot. He used to make dua a lot. And when his wife Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha asked him, why do you do that all this? You are the, the, the messenger of Allah. You are the best person. No sins on you. Why you do all that? He said, should I not be a great, grateful servant of Allah? Of Allah, kuna abdan shakura. So that's the purpose of ibadah. To show your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should do that for every ibadah. When we come to salat, why are you going to salat? One of the things is it's obligatory. I have to perform the Salat. The other thing is, yes, it is obligatory, but I am coming to Salat because I am thankful to Allah. I am grateful to Allah for His gift that He has given me. 
He has given me my life, he has given me my resources, he has given me my family, he has given me my health, he has given me so many things that if I count them, I cannot calculate them. So I am thankful to Allah. I ask him to bless me and to give me more. I seek his blessings. If you give thanks to me, I'll give you more. So this is the gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to say that I am going to be the servant of Allah always. Every human being is the servant of Allah. <clears throat> but there are some people <clears throat> who know that and some people who do not know that. Some people who pay their time on that, some people who do not. So be aware of that and obey him in every aspect of your life. To become a better person, spiritually, morally, individually and collectively. So monastic and maqasid, if both of them in the right way, they will bring their effect on the personality. They will change the personality. So my brothers and sisters, let us always keep in our mind that do not do the ritual just for the sake of a ritual. The ritual for the sake of a ritual has no meaning. The ritual has to be done with the proper intention. The righteousness is not that you turn your face this way or that way. The righteousness is not that how you stand and how you bow and how you prostrate. The righteousness is that you have your Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have your commitment to Allah. You have ikhlas, proper intention. So very, very important. Manasik with maqasid. Maqasid must be kept in our mind. And then there is another aspect of hajj, which is very unique aspect of hajj. That is, hajj is... Actually, all our ibadat are that way, but Hajj is much more than any, any of other ibadat. And that is the horizontal aspect and the vertical aspect. So Hajj has a vertical aspect and Hajj has also a horizontal aspect. The vertical aspect is our connection with Allah. That is, it connects us with our Creator. These sacred acts that we do, they are to bring your a relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by, by following the way of his prophets, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, Muhammad alayhi salam, alayhi So this is the, the connection between you and heaven. So that is very important. And that is, must remain always in our consciousness. Because when we stand our prayers, I'm turning my face towards him who created the heaven and the earth. And without any deviation, I'm not a mushrik. I'm bringing no one in association with Allah subhanahu wa in my actual worship. So that is the vertical dimension. And this vertical dimension is very, very important. But there is another benefit in Hajj. Although in, in other ibadat also you have it, when you go in the, to the masjid and do the jama'ah prayer, you have some horizontal aspect, horizontal dimension that you stand next to your brothers and sisters, your brothers with brothers and sisters with sisters, but they are there in the masjid. So you are there with uh, other Muslims. Now in Hajj, it is the dimension is much more broad and bigger. So here you have people from all over the world. And this is a very important aspect of Hajj. It brings the people together. Salat brings the people of the locality together. Juma prayer brings the, the larger locality people come together. Eid prayer brings maybe the people of the city together or people of one quarter, of one part of the city together. But Hajj, it brings the Ummah together. This is the Ummatic aspect. 
It is the aspect of the Ummah. And Muslims must be conscious of that. That we are in Ummah. And this Ummah is beyond race and color and nationality. This dimension of Islam is very important. Muslims must keep in their mind that we are brothers and sisters wherever they, we may live. Arabs, non-Arabs, whites and blacks, people of any race, any color, any ethnicity, they all say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, so they are our brothers and sisters. So in Hajj we see that. Every year we see that. And that means that people must be concerned about others. <coughs> When somebody has his mourning and her mourning and has no care and no concern with others, it doesn't belong to those Muslims. It doesn't belong to the Muslims. So it is important that people should be concerned about that. So Hajj reinforces that. Hajj builds that universal brotherhood of Islam. And that is the horizontal aspect of Hajj, horizontal dimension of Hajj. So when, you, when we go there, uh, we see Muslims of diverse races, colors, languages, and cultures, and we'll see Muslims of different schools of thoughts. So you will have Hanafis, Shafi's, Malikis, Hanbalis, all other different groups all schools of thoughts, you will see that. Uh, you see Muslims of different socioeconomic backgrounds. Some of them are very rich and some of them are poor and some of them in between. So you will see that. You will see Muslims of various educational uh, background. Some of them are highly educated, highly sophisticated, and some of them are not. So you will see that. Because the Ummah is represented there. Muslims of various political views and Muslims of uh, different spiritual levels, so different religious understandings. So we, this is the way how the Ummah is. And we have to, to know people, appreciate what we have, Whatever shortcomings we have, try to see how we can correct them, how we can make this ummah a better ummah. And this is a very important aspect of Hajj. And at the same time, it is of course our connection with Allah. The more our connection with Allah, the stronger our Iman, the stronger will be our brotherhood. And the better our Iman, the better will be our brotherhood. The more our Iman, the more will be our brotherhood. And the more the Iman of the people, the larger will be the Ummah, inshallah. So we try to increase that. So when we come back from Hajj, we are filled with Iman, filled with brotherhood, filled with concept of with sisterhood and understanding of each other. That is what uh, the uniqueness of Hajj is. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, give us the spirit of Hajj. We perform Hajj, its rituals in the right way, and then at the same time receive its meaning, its purpose. Because there are two things that are required. One is Ikhlas, the other is Salah. Ikhlas is the sincerity and Salah is the right, right way of doing it. That is do, the way that Prophet ﷺ has told and the way that is prescribed in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, but at the same time with the sincerity of the heart. Khair, our beloved Dr. Siddiqui. May Allah bless you. Khair. We have a few questions, inshallah. If you don't mind, I can uh, begin asking the questions. Well Okay, uh, the first question is, uh, since ihram is taken off after shaving hair, is tawaf performed with ihram on or with normal clothes? I'm not quite sure if this is the tawaf al-qudum or tawaf al-ifada, um, but if you'd like, Sheikh, to answer it, 
uh, I know it's a, it's part of the fiqh of of, of Hajj. Um, it's up to you, inshallah. Yes. Yeah, haram is important, but it is um, for certain tawaf. Not every tawaf requires a haram. When you go there with the intention of Umrah, then you, for your tawaf, first tawaf will be with ihram. And that means going seven times around the Kaaba in ihram, and then you perform the sai in ihram. So that is the requirement. After that, after you perform your Umrah, you are out of ihram with the trimming your hair or shaving the head. Uh, then, once, then once you are out of ihram, you are in your regular clothes. Then you perform a tawaf as many times as you, as you can, as many times as you want. And there is no requirement for any ihram for that. In a similar way, when you come back from, um, you, you, you perform your, you go to Arafah, you are in, in Mina, and then you come for, uh, for, for your tawaf of Hajj. In this tawaf of Hajj, uh, you have, if, if you have cut your hairs in Mina and you perform your sacrifice, you are in your regular clothes. You will do that tawaf in your regular clothes. Even you do your sign in your regular clothes at that time. So these are some more details of that. But the point is that not every tawaf requires a haram. Jazakallah khair, doctor. And of course, we'll cover these in the fiqh of Hajj sessions in the next coming months, uh, bithnillah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I believe these are two questions, uh, Dr. Siddiqui, and they, they follow each other, so I'm gonna ask them both together. Uh, there is um, a participant asking, are we allowed to use umbrellas during Umrah and Hajj Tawaf? That's one. And then I believe a follow-up question is, can we use an umbrella hat during Ihram? So maybe those are two connected questions. Yes, uh, nothing, nothing wrong, yes, you can use umbrella. Uh, to protect you from sun or to protect you from rain, uh, both of this umbrella, uh, I mean, what is forbidden to cover your head by something that is touching your head. So men are not allowed to cover their head when they are in ihram. Otherwise, uh, they can sit under, sh under shade and they can have the umbrella to have the shade. Uh, they can be in the bus. Uh, there is one school of thought in which uh, they say that you should not have umbrella and it should not be, um, uh, and, and the bus should not be uh, covered. So, so that's the uh, Jafri school of thought, but that's not the, uh, uh, according to Hanafi school, Maliki, Shafi, and others, that it is not required. <clears throat> Jazakallah khair, doctor. So basically, it, it, what, what you're saying is we can... Another, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, doctor. And Ahmed, you had uh, some other uh, question. The second question was there? Yes, the second question was, I, I believe, if you can wear an umbrella hat. I believe it, it ties down. Uh, I think there's a strap to your head, and then it like it's elevated, an umbrella that uh, touch, is pretty much touching. There's something that's touching your head. Is that allowed? Oh, it's the same thing. There's no, uh, there's no prohibition of using umbrella. But if it's if your if there is like a if it's uh, if it's touching your head as an umbrella, like basically it's kind of like a hat that becomes an umbrella. With, is that permitted? Some kind of hat. Correct. Yes. No, if, if it is if it is covering your head, no, no, it is no, not. It's not allowed during during ihram. Otherwise, yeah. if you are not in ihram, you can you can have it. Okay, very good. Um, another question is: Is what is Hajr Ismail? What is that? Uh, what is Hajr Ismail? Hajr Ismail is the area that is uh, uh, part of the Kaaba. That is now, it's called Hatim. That is the area. So Kaaba was, um, in the time of Ibrahim salam, was not uh, a square, but it was a little long. So when, the, when it was built, it was that the, some area was left out. 
and that is now um, there is a circle on on the side. So there is a Hajj um, Aswad, uh, and then after that, when you go further, then you will see the Hatim area. That is known also as Hajj Ismail. Doctor, um, this is also a question I believe that may have logistical and religious responses. So I'll ask it and uh, maybe I'll explain. Um, the question is, is uh, in the first webinar, the brother said to his sister that they will assign a mihram if you don't have one, but mihram is defined by the Sharia. So how can you assign a mihram to a woman? So I believe the question is, is uh, I believe the Sheikh that answered the question, I, I, I believe was, to a sister who is over the age of 45 and they're asking if they can travel without a mihram. So um, they are permitted to go without a mihram. I think that's more of a uh, logistical Saudi government rule versus the question of how you can assign a mihram to a woman. Mahram is a person to whom the woman cannot marry. I mean, beside, of course, husband, she's already married, so husband is her uh, companion. But beside that, his son, brother, uh, nephew. Uh, so these are the people who are known as Maharim. And a woman can travel with them. Now, if those are not there, and uh, a, a woman who is uh, 45 or 50 years old, according to the rules that they have, so the authorities, and then uh, they require that she is in the company of other ladies. And those ladies, they are not her mahram, but at least they are together. So there's a group there. And because of the group, they, she can go. So there's permission that a woman can travel with the group. Because the purpose is uh, safety and security. Uh, and because of that, uh, she she can perform the, the Hajj and, and Umrah in the company of those people. But younger ladies uh, who have no mahram, uh, it is better that they, they do not travel by themselves unless the mahram is with them. Jazakallah khair, doctor. I believe we have uh, approximately three more questions and then uh, we can wrap up the session, inshallah. Uh, the next question is a um, uh, question. Um, please ask Dr. Siddiqui, what dua to use to ask forgiveness? And if there is any dua book that we need to obtain before Hajj. So the question is, is what is a specific dua for forgiveness? And what dua book that you recommend, doctor, uh, if they would like to obtain one, we'll be providing them Husn al-Muslim as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the you, dua for the forgiveness is <laughs> you should repeat that. It doesn't require any book. And uh, there are many du'as of istighfar. So those du'as, uh, you, you can say that, uh, the, their, their prayer, their, their books explaining the Hajj, and towards the end, they mention many du'as. Uh, the the best dua is uh, Subhanallah Alhamdulillah La ilaha illallah Allahu Akbar. You repeat that, or you say Rabbana tina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. So they are, uh, these are short dua istighfar, and uh, then other books explaining the Hajj. They they also contain uh, many dua. Doctor, I believe this next question is. So now, as I know that uh, they've been distributing a book of uh, uh, what is a small booklet that that you that you give uh, that contains a lot of du'a. Yes, uh, Husn al-Muslim. Yes, yes, it is. Inshallah. Husn uh, al-Muslim. Correct. Husn al-Muslim uh, is the protection of a Muslim from any difficulties. Okay, um, another question is, uh, I believe this is a mechanical fiqh question, but um, hopefully, uh, if you don't mind, Sheikh, uh, if we can answer it, doctor. 
Um, the question is, is I know there are restrictions with, with regards to ihram that you cannot have stitches. Does the same rule apply on sandals, shoes, and belts? The, what what ihram should not have? So, so the question the question is is about stitching. Stitching is restricted to the actual ihram. Yes. But does it apply to sandals, shoes, and belts? I mean, stitch itself is not the prohibition. The issue is that something is not, uh, uh, your clothes are not fitting your body. That's what is said. Uh, and as far as shoes are concerned, they also have their stitches. So there's nothing wrong with wearing your shoes, uh, uh, sandals, or um, having a belt that has stitches. They, that is not a clothes. That is not a dress. That is, uh, uh, so though if they, it has some stitches, uh, the, that will that is not prohibited. Jazakallah khair, doctor. Uh, the last question. Stitches, stitches, stitches on the belt, stitches on the on the um, carry-on bag that you have, stitches on your shoes, on slippers. Uh, those things are uh, uh, not prohibited. Understood. Uh, last question, doctor, is. Um, so a participant asking what is the difference between different programs like program two, three, four, five, and six, and which one one can perform? Um, if, if I may, can I answer it from a logistical question and then um, if you'd like to add something? Yeah, that's the logistical, that's you are to mention that. Okay, so, yeah. so basically, in, 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 Sharia is concerned, there is no program one and two. <laughs> yes, so, so I, I believe the question is, is what's the difference between the programs? Uh, just uh, simply, I mean, we have them on the website, we've had other sessions with regards to the logistics and how to choose a program, but uh, between program two, three, four, five, and six, each one of them is numbered based on itinerary. So for mm -hmm. instance, program two, program four, Program five, program six, they all start in Medina first. And uh, then they go and stay in Mecca and then they go for Hajj. Yeah. While program <clears throat> three begins in Mecca for a few days before Hajj. So I think the question that the participant is asking is the differences of what you can perform. For instance, program two goes to Medina first, then arrives in Mecca on the seventh of Dhul Hijjah in Ihram for Umrah. But I believe program two can essentially do program two and program six, because they go to Medina and they come on the seventh or eighth of the Hajjah, they can essentially do Hajj Kiran and Hajj Tamattu, if I'm not mistaken, doctor, if they arrive on the seventh of the Hajjah or eighth of the Hajjah in Mecca, uh, versus program three is there for four days, so ideally they would do Hajj Tamattu uh, before Hajj, and program four as well, four and five as well, will be in Mecca four days prior to Hajj, so I would assume they would do Hajj Tamattu as well. Uh, would you like to add anything, doctor? Well, the, the people should know the difference between uh, different types of Hajj. Hajj Ifrat, Hajj Tamattu, or Hajj Quran. Somebody only make Hajj does not make Umrah. That's one category called Ifrat. Uh, somebody make Umrah and then after that take off the Ihram and when put on the regular clothes and in the regular situation. Uh, and then after the time of Hajj comes, they put on Ihram for Hajj, that's called Tamattu. And somebody will have Ihram for Umrah and Hajj together. So one Ihram, and then after that they perform Umrah, and then they continue, don't take off their Ihram, uh, continue until Hajj time. So those who are arriving on the 8th of Zul Hajjah, uh, they will not have any time to take off their Ihram and uh, be in the regular clothes and then after that put on them because 8th of Huzul Hajjah normally everybody put on Ihram to go to Mina. So that's why if somebody going from Medina on the 7th or 8th of the Hajjah, uh, the best thing is for them is to do the intention of Quran, not the Matto. Uh, if you have more time, if you are arriving in Mecca first, according to some program and perform your Umrah, then uh, you are mutamatta, that means you are tamatto. Then after that you go to Medina and come back, whatever date is there, you come back, you put on ihram, and then you continue with your hajj. 
Jazakum khair, Doctor. Uh, one last question and we'll conclude, bi'idhnillah. As far as dua is concerned, I believe one can ask Allah in their own language if any Quranic dua is preferred, is not remembered. Is that correct? The, the good to remember some of the Quranic dua, some of the duas that are mentioned uh, by the Prophet Sallallahu because they are the best duas. But then after that, use your language, yes. You use your language and say whatever you want. Uh, ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Uh, make dua for yourself, for your family, for your friends, uh, for your uh, anybody who asks you to make dua and use any language because uh, we use the language, Arabic language for dua only because we have certain duas of the Quran and the Sunnah. And those duas that are mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, we use them um, in Arabic to. Uh, because these are the words of Allah and the words of Prophet Sallallahu But other du'as, they are beautiful du'as in other languages as well. Jazakallah khair, Doctor. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Sheikh, uh, uh, Doctor, if you could kindly uh, close the session with the du'a and we'll end it a bit. May Allah bless you. Jazakallah khair. rahim ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى اللهم إنا نسلك موجبات رحمتك وعزائم مغفرتك والغنيمة من كل بر والسلامة من كل إسم والفوز بالجنة والنجاة من النار اللهم أسلحنا وأسلع أحوالنا اللهم يا حي يا قيوم يا قدوس يا رب السماوات والأرض يا ذا الجلال والإكرام نسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا ورزقا واسعا ولسانا ذاكرا وطوبة قبل الموت وراحة عند الموت والعفو عند الحساب والفوز بالجنة والنجاة من النار وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله تعالى على آخر خلقه محمد وآله وأصحابه وطبعه اجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين جزاكم الله خير دكتور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you everyone السلام عليكم